All right, here we go. So we're going to change the pace a little bit. I don't play any instruments. I just build things for a living. Uh, but uh, I'm going to share a story with you that I shared uh, not too long ago with Parker. And it's uh, survival stories uh, about uh, life going in tailspin for about nine years. Um, tattoo on my arm, which if you're looking at the video, I will flash it. So I got the cat here, Egyptian hieroglyphics in back, say eternal, front life, and then got the eye of Ra on the inside. Hurt quite a bit getting this tattoo, but uh, let me explain why I got it. Uh, story starts off when I was 16 years old. I was a football player and a golf player, two sports you don't really want to play you know, in academic sort of style because you don't lift weights and you get a little bit uh, weaker with football, but golf is fun to do. Uh, but uh, at the time I was working at a TGI Fridays. I was a host, wanted to ask a girl I work with to the junior senior prom, so I was like, what the hell? I'm going to ride my bike, get my schedule, get some food, just sort you of know, hang out for a little bit and then head home. So I uh, ride the four miles to Fridays, order some nachos, sitting in a section my sister was actually serving that night, and uh, she kept offering me a ride home. She's like, hey, you want to ride home? I was like, nah, nah, I need the exercise. It's going to be fine. So uh, that always starts a good story right there. Uh, so I'm on a 21-speed uh, mountain bike. I have no helmet because I'm a rebel like that at 17. Uh, and then I had toe clips on my bike. So I was about a mile from my house riding on a side access road. And I uh, was coming up to a light that Hospitality Row had green light, green light, turn signal was green. So I was like, okay, maybe I'll shoot across here, save myself some time instead of having to push the crosswalk. And I look over my left shoulder as I'm riding and I don't see any cars. So I keep on coming closer to the intersection, look over my shoulder, don't see any cars, shoot out into the street in 21st gear. Next thing I know, my head shaking side to side as I'm being put into an ambulance. So to fill in the blanks there as to what sort of happened, uh, as I was riding the bike, I didn't see three cars when I shot into the street. Uh, it was a four lane road. So uh, first car just missed me. Second car was a raised Ford F-150 truck, driving at 55 plus. Uh, he didn't see me, I didn't see him since I was hauling butt on my bike and uh, I got actually hit uh, with such an impact that I made both his airbags deploy, made an imprint on the hood and pushed the left front corner panel back so he couldn't open up the driver's side door. In the meantime, uh, my bike ended up 60 feet from the impact. I ended up 105 feet from the impact. Uh, basically got hit in the left lane in the crosswalk and ended up halfway through the turn signal lane going the opposite direction. Uh, broke my left thumb, left collarbone, left ankle. Uh, had pants on, which was an absolute rarity, but that's because I had golf photos that day. Uh, had a wrist watch on my left arm that ended up doing a big old huge cut on my left wrist. And had road rash that covered the right side of my face, almost tore my nostril open, tore the side of my, uh, my mouth open, and it covered the entire right arm with a chunk take it out of my hip so <clears throat> the next thing I really remember as I was being put into this ambulance was asking the paramedic what happened what happened is my bike okay and he looked at me and said you've been in an accident and your bike's gone it's like no <laughs> what happened what happened is my bike okay so I repeated this question at least four different times and so he's like do you know your name I was like yes my name is Michael Chemis He's like, do you know your phone number? I was like, yes. And I gave him my mom's phone number. And he said, sit back and re... I was out. Uh, so my father, who has been a trauma nurse for over 20 plus years at that point, uh, mainly serving in the Navy, uh, was working at a local hospital. So the paramedic recognized the last name because not many people are named Chemis. I mean, I'll be honest out there. But uh, so he wanted to try and get me taken to my dad's hospital. But because I was hit at such an impact, I had to be taken to the Desert Trauma Center. So as I get checked into uh, the hospital, uh, I remember before my, fa my family had arrived there uh, that a police officer is taking my statement. And so I'm explaining, you know, getting my schedule on the bike. And so he's writing stuff down. He goes, well, I have to let you know, sir, that I could be citing you for three different violations right now. It's like the uh, first violation is riding a bike at night without the proper lighting. Also, not having a helmet because you're under 18. And third, for running red light under a motored vehicle. Who calls a bike a motored vehicle? I mean, really, it's not, but I guess it is. So he, uh, he looked at me and said, you know, I think due to the circumstances, I feel you've learned your lesson, so I'm going to let you off tonight. 
and I distinctly remember giving him a thumbs up. It was like, thanks, man, you're really nice. Uh, and so uh, I ended up basically spending nine hours in that hospital. Uh, my father, when he showed up, was at my side doing as much as he possibly could. No one questioned him because he had the knowledge with everything. But uh, it was a painful experience with a, uh, a traveling doctor that uh, the hospital had a policy. If you had three, more than three broken bones in different parts of the body, then they're required to call the trauma team on call. And he decided not to call the trauma doctor and decided to treat me. So the treatment was quite painful. Um, as I'm sitting there in this hospital bed, uh, the nurse assistant starts cleaning the road rash on my right arm. And this is before getting any anesthetic or anything. She's basically taking a baby brush or in essence a green scrubby and distilled water and scrubbing my road rash to get clean. And I start sort of grunting and almost screaming in pain at that point. But I was like, are you going to give him something? Because you're just doing this without treating him with anything. So I end up getting a pain shot and I continue with the scrubbing. And uh, next, the, uh, the doctor put a little temporary cast on my left arm and then decided he wanted to put a cast on my left foot. But rather than just sliding me off to the end of the, uh, the gurney and just having me stay on my back, he says, you know, I do a technique that I actually roll them over onto their stomach and I have the leg up in the air. I get a better cast that way. But my dad sort of looked at him and says, he's got a broken clavicle. What, what do you want to flip him over like that? He's like, well, that's what we're going to do. So my dad just sort of went with it and three people start rolling me over and my shoulder wasn't supported enough and it dropped back and I started screaming in bloody pain. Uh, at that point, they set me back down, give me another shot, bring a fourth person in because I guess I was a big kid uh, and flip me over onto my road rash cover arm that just got cleaned and bandaged, pulled it out from underneath my body just to put this cast on and then flip me back over. Uh, so after that, uh, that nine hour experience in the hospital, uh, my mom and sister were allowed to come in and see me and, uh, instantly my sister sort of just looked and was in tears and said, I'm sorry, it's my fault. It's like, no, it's not your fault. You couldn't have known this was going to happen. It's like, well, I hate the guy that did this to you. I was like, well, I was the one that did it cause I ran a red light. So my mom was taken back by the fact that one, I'm talking. Uh, which surprised me too because I had one heck of a concussion, let me tell you. Uh, but uh, also the fact that I was taking blame for everything that sort of happened. And uh, so as, uh, as my time at this hospital is coming to an end, uh, my father decides, you know, I have the next two weeks off. I'm going to treat my son, take care of him at home. I'm not letting him spend a minute longer in this hospital. And so the traveling doctor walks over with the release paper says, you know, I really think we should call the trauma surgeon. Uh, to have him take a look at him. He's like, Dad just sort of looked him in the face and said, you should have done that the instant my son came to this hospital. So they start wheeling me through the doors and they decide uh, haphazardly to give me one more pain shot for my ride home. And so as they stick the needle in my ass, uh, I ended up basically clearing the contents of my stomach all throughout their lobby. And at that point, my dad said, son, I've never been prouder of that moment by the fact that you just puke in all throughout their place. But, uh, so that was my first accident. That was uh, March 18th, 1997. So the journey sort of continues. It was the beginning of a three year pattern. Three years later, March of 2000, my father was uh, planning a move from Indio, California out to uh, Annapolis, Maryland, because my brother's at the Naval Academy at the time about to graduate. So I uh, end up taking time off work and staying with my dad, packing up his place because he was still working nights. So it was my job to make sure everything got packed up in the boxes and wrapped, which was a huge pain, but that's what you do for your parents. You know, you got to help them out when you can. So <clears throat> we had just loaded up this truck, just finished cleaning his place, literally threw the brooms into the back of the truck and slammed the door shut so it wouldn't hit us. And it's about four o'clock in the morning. And we have this 25 foot rider truck with my dad's Dodge Avenger, which he loved this car because of the sound system. And it drove me crazy because it was always Basha and all this other smooth jazz stuff that just drove me nuts after a while. I was like in an elevator constantly while driving with him. Uh, and so we, uh, we start off on the road and we're driving on the 10 highway, uh, 30 miles into our trip. I'm sort of already trying to fall asleep. The, the truck was a new truck, had big bus driver type steering. 
that you could literally turn right to left four inches and just didn't really do much of anything. And we also, my dad had his cat. And so I had seat belted the cat into the carrier uh, to just make sure it wasn't going to slide into me. And the seat belts were so high at the point that I was actually using it as my headrest to keep my head off the side of the cab while just driving. And it was irritating my dad's neck. So we took that seat belt, put it underneath his left arm, and we're on our way. So as I'm asleep, I hear my dad basically yell my name, Mike. And then, oh, fudge. I'll say fudge because I'm probably not supposed to be cussing. I mean, well, it's pirate radio, so it doesn't really matter. So I'll just say fuck anyways. So uh, to fill in the blanks there, too, uh, it ended up, uh, as I was asleep, my dad got hit by a burst of wind that blew him 30 degrees off the road. So we saw he was coming up to a, a drainage ditch, and the bridge, the the guardrail on the bridge only went about halfway up our tires. So he saw if I tried to turn the correct, we're going to hit that guardrail, we're going to hit it, we're going to flip over, and we're both going to get killed. So when he yelled Mike, he decided that he was going to go through the guardrail and figured it was going to be a small drainage ditch and we'll just be towed out and be on our way. That's uh, As he started hitting that, uh, he uh, said, oh, fuck, when he saw the 12-foot drop-off. So at 55 miles per hour in a fully loaded truck, ended up careening through the guardrail, flew all the way across the drainage ditch and hit the rock embankment on the other side and slid up it. Everything wooden had basically splintered in the back of the truck. There was stuff that flew over our heads. The dashboard that originally had about six to eight inches between my knees and everything actually had my knees compressed and pushed into my chest. The cat had actually survived. Uh, she was meowing like crazy for the first, like, you know, 20 minutes of the trip. Didn't say a peep after that, but I guess after you kiss a cage like that, who would really want to say anything? Um, and uh, so as this truck comes to a stop, we're at about a 30 degree angle, and my dad's sort of suspended up, up high. I unbuckle myself and fall out from the truck as I'm hearing diesel fuel leaking down below me. He unbuckles the cat lets the cat go down, and a truck driver had seen the accident happen and actually climbed up onto the truck, pulled open the driver's side door, and looked at my father and said, there's no way I can get you out of here. It's all my strength to hold this door, so you have to get yourself out. So my dad basically looked down at the steering column, grabbed onto the steering wheel, and busted the steering column off, was able to climb out from the truck, and about 25 to 30 minutes were standing on the side of the road, just looking at the accident scene. It uh, was sort of unreal looking at the front end of this brand new truck to see it just mangled and two people survived this thing. Um, I was the the least for wear uh, from it and it badly bruising one of my right elbows. Uh, had some minor cuts and scrapes and a seatbelt bruise like no other that every part of my body hurt the next day. I had it easy in comparison to my dad. Uh, unfortunately, with the seatbelt being underneath his arm, as it was, he ended up kissing the steering wheel, had a huge third eye going on, uh, had also bit his tongue and broke three ribs in front and four ribs in back. So when it came to actually having to move stuff, he was not able to lift or do much of anything at that point. But uh, so as we're standing, standing on the side of the road, CHP finally shows up. And so we have two officers get out of the vehicle and they uh, sort of look at the scene and they go, well, how many dead bodies we got? We're like, none, you know? So they looked at my dad and says, were you driving? He says, yes. Did you fall asleep? He's like, no, I'm a trauma nurse. Used to work in night shifts. Here's what happened. And so as my father continues to give a statement to the first cop, I see the second CHP officer walking down to the back of the truck. And I said, are you looking for the license plate? He goes, yeah. I was like, oh, no, no, it's not there. And I walk about 50 feet in front of the truck, flip over the fiberglass hood, pull the temporary license plate off the windshield and hand it over to the police officer. And he just sort of looked at me a little dumbfounded. Uh, and about uh, 10 minutes later, as they're inspecting the scene, they're looking at my dad's Dodge Avenger sitting in the bottom of this wash. And they scratching their head going, I don't understand it. How is there sand inside this car when all the windows are shut? Well, it turned out we had the cat litter in the back seat. That cat litter flew with such a force that it actually went into jewel cases of CD holders sitting on the top of the dashboard area. So it was an intense time. Uh, basically, it walked away from that accident uh, very, very lucky. And to continue on with my tale, three years after that, had another minor accident, which 
it was more so breaking a bone in my foot playing softball, which is kind of unexpected that you break a bone playing softball, of all things, stepping onto a base. But that sort of continued my three-year pattern. And uh, so now I bring us up to 2006. I had this beautiful car, this 2000 Honda Civic Si, just redlined at 8,500 RPM, just felt like I was floating on the road, had just done some coilover suspension work on the front end, was testing it going up a mountain road that I'd driven up many times, but never driven down. And my uh, good buddy at the time, and also my car guru as I call him, uh, who had tweaked out my car to get it running so fine, had looked at me that day three t- on three different occasions, told me, take it easy, just don't put it into any trees. So I laughed and I ha ah, dick, and like, what did, you don't even, you're not supposed to say that kind of shit. So here I am, driving down the road, had a buddy in my passenger seat, take the first turn, kind of beautiful, second turn I'm getting a little bit squirrely, so I, I'm on the brakes, and the third turn was a hairpin turn coming back to the left, totally in wrong position in the road, knew I was going to be running out of road, If I jammed on my brakes, tried to turn to correct, I saw one of the back tires hitting some gravel, going sideways into a tree, and either I wouldn't walk away or my good friend wouldn't walk away. And I made the split-second decision of saying, it's a car, let's just take it forward. So I jammed on the brakes, slid through about 50 feet of gravel, hit into a tree with such a force that the back end lifted up about four, maybe five feet, and actually it twisted the car around the tree that the tow truck ended up having trouble pulling the car off the tree. Also, I had found out later that uh, I was very lucky with this being a high octane engine uh, that my fuel pump or my uh, fuel filter was about three quarters of an inch from being crushed, which if that would have gone off, basically would have made my car blow up uh, at a certain point. So uh, I get out, I'm sort of shaken from this whole thing. I look at my best friend that was sitting in the passenger seat. He was okay, a little bit stiff, uh, you know, no worse for wear. And the only thing I had from that accident was an airbag burn that was on the identical place on the opposite arm as the original cut that I had gotten when I was 16 being hit by that truck. So these accidents sort of made me wonder about things. You know, you, you get to question what's the purpose of this like everything happens for a reason yeah yeah blah 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 that's some bullshit but each time something happened i end up changing direction in my life as to what i was doing job wise and lo and behold after the 2006 accident uh end up going to uc california and while i was there i had met an english roommate that ended up getting me introduced to theater and here i am seven years later totally accident-free, broke the three-year pattern, and uh, just living the dream life, getting to make things, use my imagination daily, and paid to mess with power tools. But uh, that's sort of my story of nine years of chaos, that out of that chaos created this diamond of a uh, prop carpenter that, uh, if you'd like to see it, come to the Santa Fe Opera, getting to work on some beautiful stuff out in that location. So uh, that's my story. Thanks for listening. Hopefully you didn't fall asleep, but if you did, that's not my fault. All right, thanks, guys.